Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, what has happened to our sports teams? The San Jose Sharks, our favorite hockey team, they are in 13th place out of 16 teams. And then there are our San Francisco Giants. In the year 2021, they won a franchise record 107 games. And though they lost in the playoffs, we had great hope for them for the following season. And yet last year, they won 81 games and lost 81 games. They were very average. And then they tried to get better. They made a bid for the American League Most Valuable Player. They offered a $360 million contract, and yet he was going back to his original team in New York. He rejected the Giants. And then they tried again. They offered another contract to the next best free agent, a shortstop for $350 million, and he signed the contract. Except he failed his physical and everything fell apart. And then the Golden State Warriors, the defending NBA champions, they have lost more games this year than they've won. If the season ended today, they would not even make the playoffs. What's happened to our sports teams? This may cause us some grief. It may make us delusioned about sports. But the good thing is, it's just sports. You win some, you lose some. It really has no immediate impact on our lives in a major way, one way or another. When we become disillusioned about our teams, that's okay. There's always next season or the next game. But there are some things that we become delusioned about in real life that really matter. Things about relationships. We can become delusioned about our grandchildren. Where are they? What are they doing? Or our children, did they make the right choices? Are they doing the right things? What about our spouses and our relatives and our relationships. We can become delusioned about those when things are not going well. Being delusioned means there is a sense of expectation, a hope of something that is better that doesn't come about. And so we have great high hopes and yet things happen and we become delusioned. We become disappointed. We become a little divisive and depressed. That's what we see happening in the church at Corinth. The people were divided and they were becoming this illusion. Who are we going to follow? Paul or Apollos or Cephas or Jesus? And so there was great division among the people. They had become disillusioned with one another. Remember what I shared with you last week about this church in Corinth. They had all kinds of issues, and that's why Paul was writing to them, addressing some of the difficult issues they had to face. They were struggling with idolatry and eating food offered to idolatry. They were struggling with sexual immorality. They were dealing with lawsuits against one another, their fellow believers, their fellow believers in Christ. They were struggling with understanding the meaning of Holy Communion, the meaning of Jesus' resurrection. They were just struggling very, very much with all kinds of things, and it caused them to be divided. They could not agree on much. And they became disillusion. Becoming disillusioned with church can happen to us today too. 
Let me share with you a story. I'll read an excerpt from this book that was recommended. It's called I Am a Church Member by Tom Rayner. And in this book, he shares this encounter with two people who had this conversation about church. Michael and Liam began meeting for Monday morning breakfast at six o'clock over five months ago. They originally thought it would be a one-time event. They met in a couple's Bible study in their church. For many different reasons, they hit it off and were becoming good friends. When Michael originally invited Liam to meet him for breakfast on a Monday morning several months ago, Liam readily agreed. The two men enjoyed their time together. They enjoyed it so much that the one-time event became a weekly event. It was now rare for the two friends not to meet on Monday mornings. Early in their friendship, the conversation focused on sports, family, and politics. They had much in common. Michael was 41 and Liam was 39. They each had three kids and they were both college football fanatics. Each of them were fanatics of the same football conference teams. They were pretty fierce rivals at that. The guys thoroughly enjoy trash-talking each other's teams in a friendly spirit. But on this particular Monday morning, the conversation turned serious. Michael and his wife had noticed some changes in the demeanor of Liam in their Bible study group. He no longer seemed as interested in studying and discussing the Bible as he did talking about their church. And his comments were often critical about the congregation where the two families had their memberships. So Michael was caught off guard on that particular Monday morning when Liam lowered the poached eggs on his restaurant table. He enjoyed them, but he hardly ate. Liam didn't take long to get to the point. Michael, he began, Lana and I have decided to leave the church. The pause seemed to last minutes. Neither of the men seemed to know who should speak next. Michael took the initiative and spoke softly and deliberately. You want to tell me about it, Michael? Inquired. He honestly didn't know if Liam wanted to say anything about it. His friend seemed resolute. Nevertheless, Liam began to explain his feelings and decision. Lana and I went to the church to learn deep truths about the Bible, Liam offered. But Pastor Robert is just not feeding us. We're not getting anything out of his messages. Sitting in the service on Sunday morning is just a waste of time. Michael didn't respond. He could tell Liam had more to say. There are several people in the church. I am, Liam continued, you and Karen are the best, and there are a few more like you. He paused and his facial expressions became even more serious. But honestly, Michael, our church is full of hypocrites. Did you hear Jim at the kids' basketball game? He embarrassed me the way he was screaming at the refs. What kind of testimony is that for a Christian? And of course, everyone knows about Neil. He was supposedly this pillar of the church. And we find out he's been cheating on his wife for over a year. What kind of a church is this with these kinds of people. Liam was angry, but controlled as he continued to vent. Look, Pastor Robert acts like he cares for me, but I'm so not so sure he does. I told him that Lana's dad 
was in the hospital for hernia surgery, and he never visited him. Michael knew that Lana's father was not a church member, and he lived 50 miles away. He also knew that Pastor Roberts called him and had prayed with him. But he also knew that any rebuttal would not be appreciated at the moment. Michael held his tongue. Now it seemed that Liam's mild rant was winding down. Liam seemed exhausted, ready to bring the conversation to a close. He did, however, offer a pointed comment and two insightful questions. Michael, Liam began softly, I really like you and Karen and your kids. All of you are a class act. He paused briefly. But you seem enthused about the church. You keep serving and contributing. Don't take me wrong, but I wonder at times if you are blind to all the problems in the church. Then Liam offered a closing that really spoke more than he realized. We are really two different types of church members, he stated. Why is that? Why do we have such different perspectives? And so this story illustrates how one was totally disillusioned with church. It was about the people in the church. He didn't seem to like them but expected them to be perfect. Whereas Michael, same church, same people, but he continued to serve and to reach them. Two different members, one disillusioned, one was not. The book goes on and explains more, and I might share a little more with you later, but that's what happens. We can become disillusioned with even church. Perhaps we are even disillusioned with God. Maybe God is not meeting our unrealistic expectations. Maybe we need a little mind change. There are all kinds of things that can cause us to become disillusioned. We look at our gospel lesson today, and we see at the beginning of that lesson that John the Baptist was arrested. He was re re arrested because he had pointed out to Herod Antipas the sinfulness of marrying his brother's wife. And so John was arrested and all his followers scattered. Those he, who had, he had been baptizing by the Jordan River, they went their separate ways. Those followers must have become disillusioned and left. But then comes Jesus, fulfilling the Old Testament scriptures. And here comes Jesus, and he sees Simon and Andrew mending their nets by the water. And he says, come and follow me. And immediately they do so. And so do James and John. And when we look at this passage, we are so amazed. We look at it and we say, wow, Jesus says, follow me, and they just follow him. That's amazing. Why don't other people do that? But we must remember what we learned from last Sunday's gospel lesson. Remember, John said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And John had been pointing his disciples to Jesus and that Jesus had already met those disciples of John. Those disciples who were Andrew and Peter and James and John. And so Jesus was already having a relationship with them. The seeds were already planted so that they would then become followers. And so when Jesus saw them, mending their nets, disillusioned about what had happened to John. They responded in faith. They had new faith, new hope. 
Jesus had turned their disillusionment into an opportunity to be discipled. They followed Jesus. And that's what it means to be a disciple. To follow Jesus. We can see these disciples follow Jesus and they perform, and Jesus performs these great miracles. He begins his ministry of healing and preaching and teaching. And Jesus is saying, follow me and watch me do these amazing things. And that's what it means to be a disciple. Not that we have to do these things, but we allow God to work and we get to watch and see his mighty works among all of us. There's a great need for us to understand discipleship as well as membership. We talked about the story of two different members. One was very focused on his own preferences, on what he could get out of the church. Whereas Michael was looking at how he can best serve the Lord through that church. We often talk about church membership and how that's not the trend anymore. Have you ever been a member of a club, a resort, a health club? I once belonged to a health club where I paid $7 a month. It was great, except I never went. But there were others who would want to go, but couldn't. Unless you pay the fee, you couldn't go in. But when you pay the fee and you were a member of that club, you get all these perks. You can use all the weights. You can use the elliptical and the treadmills. You can use the swimming pool or the sauna. You could take the free classes that they offered the members. There are all kinds of wonderful membership privileges. But if you were not a member, you couldn't get in. And so when we look at membership, and we look at discipleship. That's how we often view it. I'm a member of a church, so I should have certain perks. And so that might be true. You can have some wonderful blessings as a member of the church, but the greater value of being a member of the church means that you are a disciple, that you are here to share and to give to others that through you, God is able to work and reach others. And so God will change our hearts. He can change it from being disillusioned about people, about church, about God himself, to becoming disciples who see that there is always hope in Christ. We might be disillusioned about our sports teams. Look at the San Francisco 49ers. They could be very disillusioned. They lost their starting quarterback. Then their backup quarterback was lost also to injury. And they were now stuck with the very last player drafted. A third string quarterback with no experience. And look at them now. They're on the verge of the playoffs and are favored to win. And whether they do or not, it reminds us that we might be delus delusioned about certain things in life, but in Christ, there's always hope for the future. In the name of Jesus, by his power, for his glory, amen. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding. God save your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.